At No Limits with Pastor Delman, our mission is to guide you toward a life of fulfillment where you can break free from any limitations holding you back. We thank you for tuning in into this episode of No Limits. And be sure to connect with Pastor Delman by visiting delmancoats.org to access free daily devotionals, more sermons, and other inspiring content. And now, are you ready to learn more about living life with no limits? Sit back, relax, and open your heart to receive an inspiring message from God's Word as we join pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. Delman Coates. In 2 Kings chapter 4, I want to read in your hearing verses 1 through 7. It's our focus for today's message When you have that, want you signify by saying amen. Okay. (laughs) 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. When you have that, please signify by saying amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Appreciate that. (laughs) The word of the Lord reads as follows. It says, now the wife of a member of the company of prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord. He loved God, went to church, prayed, read the Bible, worshipped, preached, had every Bible app, was active in ministry, like he really feared the Lord. But a creditor has come to take my two children as slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she answered, your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. And he said, go outside, borrow vessels from your neighbors, empty vessels, and and not just a few. Then go in and shut the door behind you and your children and start pouring into these vessels when each is full set it aside so she left him and shut the door behind her and her children they kept bringing vessels to her and she kept pouring when the vessels were full she said to her son bring me another vessel but he said to her there are no more then the oil stopped flowing and she came and told the man of God Elisha and he said now go sell the oil and pay your debts And you and your children can live now on the rest. And I just want to talk today about living and leaving a legacy of wealth. Is that all right? Living and leaving a legacy of wealth. Do me a favor. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh neighbor, we must live and leave a legacy of wealth. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord praise today. Let's let's live and leave a legacy of wealth. One of the things that many social critics and political pundits talk about today is the racial wealth gap in America. One headline in The Economist magazine read not long ago that the racial wealth gap is unchanged after half a century. According to the Pew Research, the typical white household has 9.2 times more wealth than the typical black household. That the typical white household has $250,400 and the average black household has $27,100. It is a reality that all researchers conclude is not by accident, but it's by design. The racial wealth gap is not an accident, it's not Incidental is intentional. It is the result of centuries of government policy that denied blacks access to housing, uh, lending, land, jobs, education, and health care. And what is most alarming is that rather than the wealth gap decreasing, it is increasing. But what I find most disconcerting, church, is that the wealth gap is increasing at a time when blacks have supposedly made so much social and political progress in America. Think about this. There are 10 black billionaires at least in the United States, more than we've ever had. There are 
more blacks in front of and behind the camera in Hollywood than we've ever had. Black athletes are signing 200 plus million dollar contracts. There are a few black singers and rappers who have become independently wealthy in music and fashion and in beverage industry. We have African American history, we have an African American history museum and an MLK memorial in Washington, D.C. We've made so much progress in politics as well. The number of blacks in the Congressional Black Caucus is at an all-time high at 58. We've had our first black president, now our first black woman vice president, and we've had the first black woman appointed to the Supreme Court. And so the fact that we've seen, uh, we, have, we, have, we have seen to have come so far on so many other fronts makes the realities of the racial wealth gap just that much more troubling. And it ought to force us to ask, how is it, can we have all of these signs of progress and indications of success on the one hand and yet as a collective still be so far behind? How is it that things can seem to have improved so much and that we have seemingly have so much power and at the same time there is so much inequality and things seem just the same? In his book, Power and Powerlessness, John Gaventa addresses this very same dynamic and explores what he calls the hidden faces of power. And he talks about the stark incongruity between progress on the one hand and the pervasiveness of poverty and inequality on the other hand. And he says this disjointedness, this incongruity is a function of how power is manipulated and how it is used to control the oppressed. He says that what happens is, is that elites maintain their power by restructuring the the basis for systemic legitimacy and that in doing so power succeeds in staying in power by inducing sleep in the oppressed what he calls quiescence in the powerless Gaventa says that power is maintained in the face of stark inequality by causing the oppressed to be lulled asleep and it, is do, and it is done by redefining the terms of progress. It, we fall asleep by restructuring the basis for legitimate uh, systemic progress so that people are made to think there's progress when there's really not. And for black people, we have been lulled to sleep. I want to contend by giving us trinkets of success and calling that progress. Y'all don't have to say amen to me here today. It, it, the reason we have this stark contrast, this stark incongruity between symbols and signs of success on the one hand, and yet the reality of poverty and inequality on the other hand, because they give us trinkets of progress when the reality is something else. I want to give you four things that American society gives black people as signs of progress to cause us to be lulled to sleep. Meanwhile, the racial wealth gap continues to get wider. There are four things. Tell your neighbor four things. Write them down. There are, there are four things. Write these four things down. It's an acronym. You know what an acronym is? Like an acronym is an abbreviation with a couple of words to form another word like LOL, laughing out loud. This is what they give us. It's an acronym. Symbols, holidays, images, and tokens. Ah, tell your neighbor, it's an acronym. It's an acronym. First, they give us symbols like street signs. We're going we gonna to name a street after you. MLK Boulevard. Tell your neighbor, it's a symbol. Then they give us holidays. You know, King Day. What's the latest one? Juneteenth. Symbols, holidays. Then they give us images. 
like putting more black people on TV, giving us black Barbie dolls or giving us more black coaches in the NBA or NFL. And, and then they give us tokens, more black people on corporate boards, black running mates, black head coaches, black head fund managers, Harriet Tubman's picture on the $20 bill, allegedly, you name it. But, but my point is that in order to develop and to maintain the state of slumber and sleep or quiescence in the oppressed, they give us the acronym. Mm -hmm. Symbols, holidays. Uh, Y'all in here today, they give us the acronym images and tokens to restructure the basis for the system's legitimacy by getting us to think that by giving us the acronym that progress is really being made by getting us to think that by having more diversity at the table means that we're sharing in more wealth from the table and that by giving us more signs and symbols and another black billionaire then of course that is more progress for your people right by giving you more symbols and holidays and images and tokens by giving you another person to sit on a seat and give uh, be in a position then there's progress for your people people right meanwhile while they give us the acronym the symbols the holidays the images and the tokens I'm trying to keep it clean by giving us the acronym we'll end up thinking that's progress my mom's trying to figure it out my dad's trying to show her Tell your neighbor, don't confuse the acronym for substance. Don't confuse symbols with real wealth. They, they give us a holiday and then they put all of our leaders before us and they sell us the acronym, but making us think that it's progress. And then our leaders get up before us and tell us they got a monument and we got a peop people on a board and because they got another black billionaire and we fought to use the struggle of the people to get individuals to get more symbols, holidays, and images, and tokens, then progress has been made. Here's where we are today. We got one party that gives us nothing and, and, is, is, and is unapologetic about it, and another party that gives us the acronym and wants us to be happy about it. They allow us to have more tokens so that we don't start demanding more of the economic pie. And so don't confuse my point. My point is not that symbols, holidays, images, and tokens are not important. They are. My point is that if we are not careful, we will confuse the system, giving us the acronym with us getting the solution to close the racial wealth gap. You can get the acronym, the symbols, the holidays, the images, and the tokens, and still not close the education gap, the job gap, the housing gap, the wage gap, the health care gap. I don't just want the acronym. I want the substance so that we can have the wealth that we need. I think it was Danny Glover in uh, Juice who said just because you pour syrup on the acronym, don't make it pancakes. I'm tired of leaders pouring syrup on the acronym and want us to celebrate and act as if it's pancakes. So, so we end up thinking that the number of black billionaires is the goal, that getting another black holiday is the goal, that fighting for another black, black rapper to get a liquor brand deal is the goal, that it'll address the structural wealth gap. No, as a people, we keep getting syrup poured on symbols, holidays, images, and tokens, and they want us to be happy and to claim it's pancakes, but it's not. It's just the acronym. Tell your neighbor, it's just the acronym. And there's probably no greater example of the insufficiency of symbolism for a people who need substance and wealth than in our text today. 
Here is a widowed woman and her children who are struggling with finances in their household. Apparently, the husband and father has died and left them in a bad financial situation. They are desperate. They are despondent. And the boys are on the verge of being sold into slavery as recompense for their father's debt. It is often assumed, church, that this family is destitute because they are poor. But I don't read it that way. Just because you are in debt does not mean that you are poor. I, I see indications in this text that suggest that this man and his family were not poor. They were just poorly pro programmed. And it is our programming that affects our legacy. Did y'all hear me? It is our programming in our mind that affects our capacity to live and to leave a legacy of wealth. It has been said someone is sitting in shade today because someone else planted a tree a long time ago. And the question we all must ask is what kind of tree trees are we planting for our children and our grandchildren? Notice what verse 1 says. Verse 1 says that there was a man who was a member of the company of prophets. That's interesting to me because it implies that her husband was a man who had a good job. It implies that her husband was a man who had status in the community as a member of the company of prophets he had a job y'all and it came with perks he was he had a thriving ministry that put them in the upper echelon of society for sisters in that culture she was then married to a man who had status and standing in the community but upon his death she soon discovers the inadequacy of status symbols as a sign of success for all we know they could have given her husband a street name after him they could have dedicated a holiday to him. They could have given all kinds of images and tokens around him, the acronym, but all of the symbols in the world did not prevent the family from falling on hard times. They had recognition and celebrity. They had millions of followers on the gram, but, per, but they, when he died, the symbols, the holidays, the images, and the tokens did not deliver wealth. They are able to stunt on the gram but can't afford the things that they had and it's quite possible that the stress of trying to keep up appearances of being prosperous end up leading that man to die. You do know trying to keep up with the Joneses and trying to keep up with other people when you can't afford it will stress you out. And if there's one thing that eats away at our ability to save, invest, and secure our family's future. It is being seduced by symbolic appearances of wealth. Status symbols and images of success, church, don't create wealth. You can look rich and not be rich. You can be look good, fresh, dressed like a million bucks and be broke. It's why it's been said that if you don't learn how to manage your money, your money will manage you. And many people are finding themselves stressed out trying to keep up with other people. And while I'm not one who believes in promoting false stereotypes about the spending habits of black people and implying that black people are somehow the only population of Americans who spend their money in certain frivolous ways, I do think we need a healthy critique of the culture's obsession with lifestyle labels and luxury and equating that with wealth. Can I tell you something? Most of the country's wealthiest people do not live in mansions. <laughs> Mo 90 plus percent of the country's millionaires do not drive $300,000 cars. 90 plus percent of the nation's rich are not stunting on the ground, uh, putting pictures of their designer bags on the table, pitching it, uh, uh, taking a snap in it so everybody can see it. They're not taking Birkin bags to the grocery store. Got a $50,000 bag, pushing it around in the grocery store, posting it for other people to see. Don't be, we, don't be one of those people 
uh, uh, who make getting a $5,000 bag your goal but having no money in it. Don't be one of those people who drive an expensive car and live in an elite neighborhood but can't go to sleep at night because you cannot afford the note. I want to contend that this family may have gotten in this situation because they got caught up in looking good but not actually doing good. Let's not get so caught up in looking fly that we're flat out broke. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that song, Still Fly by the Big Timers, 2002? Got one. Y'all don't remember that song? Manny Fresh and, and Birdman. This just came in my head. I think the song goes gator boots with a pimped out Gucci suit. Ain't got no job, but I'm still fly. Can't pay my rent because all my money's spent, but that's okay. This is not in my notes. Holy Spirit just reminded me. You focus on looking fly. Or the opening line of Wipe Me Down from Boosie. Remember that? Pull up to the club, VIP. Gas tank on E. But all eyes on me. Wipe me down. <laughs> we celebrate looking good but not doing good. I want to I want to do well. How we got a witness here? And listen, in order to do well, you have to have a plan for your death while you are yet living. What is it? There are two things that are certain, death and taxes. And what stands out to me about this text is the impression that I get that when this woman's husband died, the family has no knowledge of the family's financial situation until the creditors start knocking at the door. I think that is the greatest tragedy in this text, that she spends all of her time married to him, doing life with him, raising children with him, and presumably thinking that everything is okay, and then upon his death she realizes that the family is not protected and the truth is that this is not an uncommon situation I recently read about a woman whose husband died and when he died she learned that the beneficiary of his pension was still in the name of his first wife and so she had been counting on money to pay off his debts and now that he it is now that he has died his money went to the first wife she is now uh, unavailable to have that money and she is still in debt. It happened because she was not involved in the household finances and assumed that her husband had taken care of everything and now they are in crisis. Here is a woman in this text who ate with her husband, slept with her husband, prayed with her husband, but didn't discuss finances with her husband. And so I want to suggest that we got to avoid that from happening by creating a culture in our families and in our relationships and in our marriages where there is communication and transparency about the financial situation of the household. So that when you die, not if you die, I know you think you're going to be around here. So that when you die, your family is protected. Let's create a culture of transparency in the home where, where somebody knows how much money we have, what, what debts are owed, and whose name stuff is in. Let's create an environment in our families where we can talk about what accounts exist, what debts are owed, and what your wishes are in the event of a medical crisis, and you cannot speak for yourself. Let's take the taboo out of talking about these things so that your loved ones are not caught off guard and are left financially exposed and unprotected at their time of grief. 
let's make planning for our family's future a holy act. Let's make it an act that is just as holy as worshiping together, as praying together, so that, so that at the very least you can fund your own funeral without stressing your family out by trying to figure out how to bury your behind. Do a will so that Ray Ray and Aunt Jackie don't end up arguing over who's going to get the stereo or grandmama's diamond necklace or worse, it doesn't get left up to a judge to decide who is going to get your family property so here's what I want all of us to do here's what I, I want all of us to do I want us to start having regular family meetings about finances I want you to talk about and document what accounts exist and who has and will get access to those accounts when you die. You don't have to give people a mouse, but somebody needs to know where the stuff is. You got to get, I want all of us to get with an attorney. I'm preaching to myself. The, uh, these are things that I need to do for myself. You got to get with an attorney to draft a will. Everybody, I want you to get a will. Look at your neighbor and say, let's get a will. Let's get a will, baby. Got to get a will. If you got more stuff, you need to get an estate plan and get an estate done, right? Learn about all of that. Let's make it a holy thing to prepare in advance by getting an advanced health care directive which expresses your will for your loved ones in the event your health deteriorates and you cannot express your desires any longer. Every person needs to have a health care directive and please, please, pretty please every person in this church ought to make it a sacred holy act to get life insurance get life insurance get get ideally I want you to get some permanent life insurance so that when you die you can give your children your husband your wife your grandchildren, you can pass something down. We get, we get caught up in so many tricks and schemes about wealth that we miss the one thing that can guarantee that when you die, you're going to leave $25,000, $100,000, $500,000, million to your family. I want every family to make getting life insurance a policy. I'm talking to you right here. If you are 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, I want everyone to make sure you get, if you leave this service today and somebody says, what did the pastor talk about? The pastor said he wants me to get life insurance and to make it a priority. It is the one thing that will guarantee we pass wealth down to our family. There are even stories of wealthy family dynasties in America that get life insurance policies on babies when they're born. When it's cheapest. When they're born, you can get a policy, 500000 and pay pennies. Of, well, now dollars. <laughs> get your permanent life insurance policy. If you really care about your family, Get life insurance. We have all kinds of information that are available today. I hope you leave here today determined to get information about life insurance, whether it's from someone here or someone when you get home. The man in this story may very well have been bound for heaven, but he did not protect his family when he died. This text is a wake-up call to not be seduced by symbols, to make plans for our death while we are living, but thirdly, also to make sure we are not deceived by financial scams. I'm talking about leaving and living a legacy. What stands out to me, church, is that when this family fell on hard times, the prophet advises the woman to take inventory of what she had in the house. I want y'all to hear me today. He, he says, I want you to take inventory of what you have in the house and I want you to go and borrow empty jars from your neighbor and I want you to start pouring the little oil in those jars and go sell them and pay off your debts and live on the rest. And what's noteworthy than me, church, is that the prophet asks her what she has 
in her house. And he does that, I believe, because in part he does not want her to become a victim of the many financial scams that were going around at the time that prey upon financially and emotionally vulnerable people. I'm working on something right here. Elisha knows that there are con artists out there who will try to manipulate you and exploit you and try to give you a plan for so-called wealth creation that is based on something that is fake and phony rather than an honest business model for generating a sustainable income. And that church is how God wants us to develop wealth. God wants us to develop wealth by having a, an honest business model for generating sustainable income. It is based upon a sound ethical business plan that's not based upon exploiting other people. Nobody who is telling you that God wants you to be rich as a result of exploiting other people is not sent from God. And I note that church because I frequently see people get deceived and taken advantage of by get rich quick schemes that promise quick profits and the allure of a lavish lifestyle. I'm unhinged right here. And when people are desperate financially, they become emotionally susceptible to being seduced by scrupulous people promising hope and a way out of their despair but they are really frauds who are trying to steal your money in the process. We have seen this in our lifetime. In less than 25 years, we've seen three market crashes that have devastated our economy and they were all based on fraud. Many of you remember the dot-com crash in 2000 when technology enabled people sitting at their desk and on their toilets to trade stocks and to think that they could get wealthy by investing in the market and the numbers, the stock prices kept going up and up and the good times were rolling until it all crashed. We all remember the real estate and the global financial crash of 2008 when real estate prices were going up and up and up. You would drive by subdevelopments, they would have a sign outside in March of that year said houses, luxury homes from the 400,000s. Three months later it would say luxury houses from the 500,000s. Two months later, same neighborhood, luxury houses from the 700 In one year, the houses in the same development went from 400,000 to 700,000. And people were drunk with the wine of turning their homes into cash and taking money out of their houses. And it was good until it wasn't. And then the market crashed and the global financial market went into a basket. Here recently, we've seen the cryptocurrency craze and every day, a few years ago, people were selling the public on the dream of making money in private digital currencies. You can get rich. It's the future. Private digital currencies. You can start selling NFTs and everybody ought to get an NFT. What does an NFT stand for? It is a non-fungible token. Well, what does that mean? It means nothing. It is a market based on nothing. Crypto is a money branded currency, which means it's called money, but it ain't. A non-fungible token. That's a fancy way of saying nothing. They done figured out how to use technology to get people to invest in nothing. And the times are good until it ain't. And then it all comes tumbling down. Miami's arena was named the crypto arena. Now it ain't. What happened? They were all, y'all listen to me, they were all scams driven by momentum. It's called FOMO. Say FOMO. FOMO, FOMO is another acronym. It's cleaner. It's, it's called the fear of missing out. And they were all just waves. And, and if you were on the wave, it was good as long as the wave was going up. And you were making money on the way up. 
But then when the wave gets to the top and the people who started the wave start taking all of their money out, then the whole house of cards crashes. I want the people of God to be very careful about people in the world and even people in the church who will get you sucked in to these momentum-driven schemes under the guise of investments and wealth creation and even entrepreneurship and multiple streams of income and getting you a hustle. That, that's the one thing that I am really concerned about today, that we are get, losing our wealth because we're being sucked into these get-rich-quick schemes. We, p- people end up quitting their jobs for all of these multiple streams of income, and then they fall on hard times. I want you to be careful. Tell your neighbor, be careful. Be careful of some of these network marketing schemes. Because many of them are just technical ways to avoid illegal pyramid schemes. You know, pyramid schemes in America are illegal. You will go to jail if you get caught up in a pyramid scheme. You can lose money and get fined. And the reason people quit, make you quit your job is because they want you to be financially dependent. I'm trying to help somebody here today. Because if you lose your job, then you become susceptible to all of the aggressive pressures and tactics that they get you to try to go out there, sign up your mama, your grandmama, all of their friends, all of your neighbors, all of your friends' friends, and your friends' friends' friends. And the reason it's a pyramid scheme is because the focus is not on the product. They sell you on a dream of signing up other people. You can do it in your church. They come meet with your pastor. You know, if you let us set up shop in your church and you get your people signed up for this program, I just heard all of them, prepaid legal, uh, travel this, and uh, 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 Tupperware. Uh, no, not Tupperware. That was 30, 40 years ago. All of these different things. Cosmetics. And the reason it's a pyramid scheme, I really want you to get this, because they're selling it every day on Instagram. There are people who are really mortgaging their future on all of these fake ideas, and the reality is it's just an illusion. And you realize years later, after you poured in all your money, after you done left your job, now you it costs you your relationships with your family member. Nobody wants to answer your call anymore. No one does not want to pick up because they know you are just calling to sell them another pipe dream. And you got a closet now. You got a garage now that is filled with products that don't nobody want. You got to be careful about some of these businesses because they will ruin your future and cause you to be buried in debt. Let me move on here. This text, the family in this text gets in trouble, church, because they became casualties of the credit system, of the debt system. Someone to whom her husband was indebted was going to take her two children as slaves. And church, I want to tell you that dying in debt is worse than dying broke. When you are broke, you have nothing. When you are in debt, you got less than nothing. And there is nothing worse than having a whole lot of stuff and still being in financial bondage. The other day, I saw this statistic that Americans have over $1 trillion in credit card debt and that 58% of blacks uh, say that they, are have, they have more debt than they have savings. Can you believe that? There are six out of 10 of us here today have more debt than we have savings. And I want to tell you that this is not an accident. In the 70s, banks realized that people spend more if they got a credit card in their pocket. McDonald's and Burger King realized that their profits from selling hamburgers went up 15 to 30 percent when people had plastic cards in their pocket and they thought that credit was money. But can I tell you something? Credit is not money. Tell your neighbor, credit, it ain't money. So they end up flooding the market with these plastic cards in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s to get people not hooked on phonics, but to get them hooked on credit. Don't get hooked on credit because whenever you are in debt, you are in bondage. Financial bondage, church, is the new slavery in America. I'll get out of your way. This family was in financial trouble, but there's some good news. And the good news is, is that even though they were in trouble, God reversed it. Just 
when this sister was on the verge of giving up and throwing in the towel, God turned things around, church. And he did it by multiplying what she already had in her house. With everything that the family lost, God wanted them then and us now to know that no matter how bad things become, that you can make it on what's left. And I don't know how you feel about it, but that's good news. <laughs> that if you offer what you have up to God, he can take your little bit and turn it into a lot. <laughs> Have I got a witness here? <laughs> they got their miracle after God blessed what they already had in their house. And the key to turning things around for them, it was already in their house. The solution for their situation, it was already in their house. The answer to getting their lives back on track was already in their house. Look at your neighbor, say, neighbor, we got everything we need. God has a plan for your life and mine, and it's already in our houses have I got a witness here and people may think that it sounds silly to be told to borrow vessels before you got the oil to put in it logic suggests that it's better to have the oil first and then run and get the vessels afterwards show me the oil and then I'll supply the vessels but God doesn't work that way God lets us see it he doesn't let us see it before you got to believe it on the front end. Then you'll see it on the back end. Have I got a witness here? Faith is when you believe it first and then you'll see it later. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Have I got a witness here? And the story says that the debts got paid because they had faith to believe it before they saw it. I've got a witness here. See, faith church doesn't always add up. Faith doesn't always compute. They had to provide empty jars for oil they could not see. And that's faith. And when they gave God faith, the Bible says God blessed it. And the debts got paid because God took a little bit and turned it into a lot. I've got a witness here. And what shouted me is that the story says that they went on living on leftovers. I've got a witness here. You do know you can live on leftovers. I've got a witness. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we can live on the leftovers and what I like is God didn't just give them enough he gave them more than enough have I got a witness is there anybody here who can testify that God will give you more than enough he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ever ask or think because he gives you more than enough when he fed the 5,000 they had some left over David says my cup runneth over Malachi says that God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there won't be room enough to receive it. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given you good measure. Press down, shaken together running over yeah running over shall men put into your bosom all the Lord needs is for you to give him a little bit 
I've got a witness. I know your problems seem large. I know your circumstance seem great. But I want to tell you that we serve a God who can take a little bit and turn it, turn it, turn it into a lot. He took a staff and opened the Red Sea. He took a slingshot and defeated a giant. He took an angel and called the lion's den. He took a harlot and saved the nation. He took a jawbone and killed a thousand Philistines. He took dirty water and healed Naaman. He took a shout and tore down the walls of Jericho. He took the hem of his garment and healed that woman of her issue of blood. He took prayer and shook the foundation of a prison. He took an old rugged cross and defeated death, hell and the grave. He took his blood and bought salvation of the world. He took an old borrowed tomb and conquered death. And that's why I'm preaching. That's why I'm shouting. That's why I'm dancing. Because the Lord can take a little bit and turn it into a lot. Yeah. Yeah, won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he fight your battle? Won't he build a bridge over troubled water? Come on, give God glory. If he's ever taken your little bit and turned it into a lot. Hey, 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 yeah, don't you give up. Let's live and leave a legacy. Let's, let's not be seduced to sleep when they give us the acronym. Remember symbols, high holidays, images, tokens. It's just the best way I could do it, Reverend Rice. It's the best way. Plan for your death while you're living. I'm sorry, Mom. I'm sorry you had to have that in your head. Y'all pray for me. I'm still in process. Let's, let's make talking about the state of the family's finances a holy act. Let's get that life insurance. Everybody get you some life insurance. $10,000 policy, $100,000, get something. Preferably, a, I, I like, get term is okay and that's cheaper. I get, get life insurance. I like permanent policies in case you outlive the term. No, really. I just had a policy last year. January that I got 20 years ago and and it was a 20 year term policy so it expired now I'm trying to go back and get them hey <laughs> can I get that same deal at 51 did I got at 31 no I don't know sorry yeah it was $600 a year, 30 years ago. I mean, 20, 30, when I was 20 years ago. Now it's $9,500 a year if I wanted to keep it. I said, okay, I got to think about this. I'll come back. I wish I was thinking about it like that 20 years ago. Get you some life insurance. 
And don't get caught up in all of these scams and schemes. And look, this is not about offending anybody. Yes, there are some of these things that, but after a while, you know, what is it? Is it just based on momentum and signing up people and signing up people and signing up more people and just more people? I don't know. That's a, be careful with that. And don't get buried in debt. No Limits was created to help you strengthen your relationship with Jesus and to help you explore the limitless possibilities for your life. Connect with me today through our website at delmancoats.org. There you will find free resources available for immediate download with no obligation whatsoever. I begin each day thanking God for you and those like you who watch and support this ministry. It is truly a blessing to serve you. Once again, you can find us at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And remember to live your life each day with no limits. I am so glad that you took the time to watch this message today. If you have been blessed by this outreach, I'd like to ask you to become a partner in this ministry so that together we can reach the world for Jesus Christ. My heart is to reach people just like you all around the world and to tell them that God loves them and wants to empower them to live a life with no limits. Your financial investment in this ministry will enable us to spread the good news of Jesus Christ around the world so that more people can be inspired and encouraged. Will you help me to reach those people? Will you join me in empowering the lost and the forgotten? Will you be my partner as we teach people to truly live a life with no limits? To make a donation safely and securely, go to our website at delmancoats.org. That's delmancoats.org. And look for the donate button on the top right of the homepage. Thank you in advance for your support and for becoming a true partner in No Limits. Your partnership and financial gift will help us impact the world by bringing hope to those who need it. Your generosity today is a reminder of the goodness of God. Thank you again for watching No Limits with Pastor Delman. This episode of No Limits with Pastor Delman has been made possible due to the generosity of viewers like you. 